Thank you so much for tuning in to KEXP. We're listener-powered radio at 90.3 FM in Seattle, streaming worldwide at kexp.org. I'm Cheryl Waters, and I have not been able to stop listening to Jamila Wood's newest album, Legacy Legacy, since it came out last year. And it is my great fortune to have her and her band live in the studios here at KEXP today. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having us. I've been looking forward to this for such a long time, so I'm just going to let you start with a couple of songs and we'll have a chat. It's Jamila Woods live on KEXP. Certain how I just come by for more. I've always been the only every classroom, every home. Kiss of chocolate on the moon, collard greens and silver spoon. Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes they can stick onto me. My weaponry is my energy. I tenderly. Live in the KEXP studios with Jamila Woods. I am so perfect, so divine, so ethereal, so surreal. I cannot be comprehended except by my permission. I mean, I can fly like a bird in the sky. Thank you. 
You might wanna hold my comb when you find out what I'm made of. You might wanna follow me and copy all of my mistakes. I'm so nice, so nice. You cannot smile when I smile, and I cry, I cry. It just rains, so I do. Any minute now you get the message. Any minute, money pick up app description. I'm impressive. You can check my top for reference. Moon and sun kiss, rev and blessed. Come on, listen to a quick confession. Water is oil, me to your regression. I'm protected. Joy set a plate on me. My mother stays on me. No one can take that energy away from me. I've been up in this since grandma was a baby. Praise me. I be on my Giovanni T and Honey. Tell it like I see. Speaking so I be. Outstanding. It's Jamila Woods live on KEXP. How much do you love this band? Oh, I love them so much. <laughs> Can we meet the players in the room? Yes. Um, so Ami is on keys and guitar, musical direction. Justin Canavan is on guitar. Um, Matthew Skills is on the bass. And Leonard Maddox is on the drums. 
You can see this fantastic band tonight at the Neptune Theater here in Seattle playing with Rafael Sadiq. That's going to be a fantastic show. And wow, already you're sounding so amazing today. I've been waiting so long to hear the songs from Legacy, Legacy Live. Your new album is incredible. It's titled Legacy, Legacy, all caps and exclamation points after each legacy. And on it, you've built a sonic monument to iconic black and brown artists. And each track bears the name of an artist who's inspired you. And such a range there from visual artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat and Frida Kahlo. You've got musicians, Muddy Waters, Miles Davis, Betty Davis, mm -hmm. which is such a great inclusion. And then writers and poets, Zora Neale Hurston, Sonia Sanchez, James Baldwin, um, and Nikki Giovanni's on there, mm -hmm. Octavia Butler, Sun Ra. I mean, the list just goes on and on. It gets more exciting. I imagine you must have had an even longer list of artists who inspired you. How, how did you, um, you know, settle on the ones yeah, that you chose yeah. for this record? Yeah, that must have been challenging. Yeah, I tried to keep it an organic process. You're right. I definitely had a list, a longer list of artists, um, more poets on the list, um, and but I tried not to force it. Like if it wasn't coming, I tried not to, I tried to just focus on the songs that felt more easy. And I worked with a producer um, who's based in Chicago named Slot A. And we really had a good relationship of not just trying to make the music, but to really have conversations about the people who inspired each song and what they meant to me and what I was trying to say also about myself through, through each song. The lyrics on Legacy Legacy are a masterful feat, and I know that you did a lot of research, and that sounds like a lot of fun to me, especially when you see the list of people that you wrote about, and it sounds like you referenced essays and documentaries and interviews. Tell me about that process. Yeah, I think I had just gone on this rabbit hole on YouTube, as we often do. Um, and I was just, I love watching interviews of artists who I like. And I was noticing this pattern of amazing um, black artists and, you know, people like Muddy Waters, Basquiat, and kind of back in that time, you didn't see a lot of people of color interviewing people of color. And the questions they would ask them would sometimes have these sort of like subtext to them or kind of like be taking subtle shots or like kind of trying to prod them in little ways. And I, I observed watching how they would deal with that. And it, it was really empowering to me as an artist. You're always trying to present yourself and trying to protect, you know, your individuality and who you really are. And it was just really inspiring to watch those interviews and particularly Muddy and Basquiat were inspired kind of directly by quotes that, that Basquiat and Muddy Water said in those interviews. And then sometimes it was a lot more organic than that. Like I saw a picture of Frida Kahlo's house with Diego Rivera and it's two houses separated by a bridge. I was like, goals instantly like that's that just related to me instantly so sometimes it was like more intense research and sometimes it was more just like a a connection that I felt to some aspect of that person that I wanted to express something about myself through them you're telling a story through your written word and your voice and how did you approach writing a song about a person uh yeah I think I didn't really try to write about about any of them. I think that would have been way harder. Um, I don't think of them so much as biographical songs about the people, but more so each song is a self-portrait of myself through the lenses of each of those people. And it allowed me to kind of be more vulnerable and honest about some of the things that I felt and that I have experienced because I felt almost like standing on the shoulders of ancestors in some cases or elders um, in some cases of just these people who um, kind of gave me the strength to tell these stories that I don't think I had a, a way into them before. I heard that the title Legacy Legacy was inspired by a collage that you saw at a friend's house. Tell me about that piece of artwork and what particularly struck you about it and you knew I've got the title of my record. Yeah, it was funny because I actually had been calling, I had a, like a working title of the album Songs About People, like like you said, and um, I had some good friends in my life who were like, um, that's not, that's a crappy title. You need to like think about that <laughs> some more. And so I just happened to be like the next week at my friend's house and Krista Franklin has this letterpress of a quote from a Margaret Burroughs poem that says Legacy Legacy. Um, and the poem is that she's referencing is all about it's written kind of like to black young people and all about like, look at these people who have come before you 
And, you know, what will your legacy be now that you have all of these people who have um, come before you? And when I saw that, I was like, wow, I, I recognize it from the poem right away. And I was like, that's what I'm doing. I'm not writing songs about people. I'm writing, I'm writing kind of the imprint that all of these people's legacies have had on me. And it's going to encourage me to find my own. So that's kind of, in a way, it makes sense to me that there's two, because it's like the legacy that's come before and the legacy that I'm making. That sounds very empowering. Do you feel like you're kind of a different person after having gone through the experience of writing this and learning about all these people and how their work and their lives have influenced you and had an emotional connection with you? I definitely do. Like when we started rehearsing the songs, like with the band for the first time and arranging, I felt it just makes me feel really powerful performing these songs in a different way than I think um, some of my other music is also great to perform. But I definitely feel like it's channeling a different energy that has been really healthy for me. The, the last song, the second song you performed today, Giovanni, is I heard the first song that you wrote inspired by poet Nikki Giovanni. Mm -hmm. And I read that you teach her poem, Ego Tripping, um, to the students you work with. And I'm curious about your relationship with her work and also the work that you do with the Young Chicago Authors. Yeah, so um, when we when I teach poetry or when I, when I was working with Young Chicago Authors, it was always about like building a bridge between what students know already to what they might not know. So, for example, like I love to teach Kendrick Lamar's song, I, with Nikki Giovanni's Ego Trippin', because it's all, like, we kind of talk about Nikki Giovanni's poem as, like, the first, like, battle rap. Like, it's, it's essentially just saying how dope she is, and from a, but from a very, like, femme woman, black woman perspective. And so I think that's something I love about her work. It's just there's so many tie-ins that can come so easily to hip hop and things that young people already are familiar with. Um, but for me, I really wanted to cover that poem and kind of think about what are the things that make me feel like the, the greatest things about myself. I can kind of like brag on myself a little bit, not just for the sake of bragging on myself, but to kind of just carve out space. And I think that's important for black women especially to do is just carve out space to appreciate ourselves. You mentioned battle rap, and I read in one interview that you said Slade encouraged, or you encouraged you all to watch some battle rap to kind of push through a writing block. Tell me a little bit yeah. about that. Um, that was when we were writing the song Baldwin, inspired um, by James Baldwin, and I was just thinking about moments of microaggression, both like interpersonally that I've experienced with white people, but also like looking at Chicago, all cities really, but the gentrification that's happening in certain neighborhoods and just the way that um, that just affects people on a daily basis. And he was saying, if you're trying to write a poem like or a song critiquing someone or like battling them, essentially, you have to almost love them. You have to know them to the point of loving them to really do it properly. You can't just come at it in a surface level way. So then I was reading all these articles about just, you know, police brutality and like the, the fear of black people, black men is at the root of a lot of that. Just the fear like the, of perceiving black people as a danger. And so trying to really connect to like, what are the emotions going on that's at the root of this violence and trying to kind of come at it from that. And so that's kind of like what the verses try to do in that song. And yeah, it's kind of just, I guess the battle rap just opened it up to, to not letting me get off so easy. Cause it's easy to just rant about something that is bothering you or that you don't like. And so to work a little bit harder than that, to try to come at it from a place of empathy that can allow you to really get at the root of the issue and not, not let it off, but just be really honest when you're addressing it. Sounds super powerful. And I mentioned, or you mentioned the work that you do with teens, and it sounds like you had some really great mentors when you were a teen. Talk a little bit about that. I did. Um, I had a mentor named Avery R. Young, who is an amazing poet and singer, performer. And I actually think about him, I was thinking about him earlier today, because he always just talked about remembering why you wrote something before you perform it, like really going back into that space and centering yourself in that, because it's easy to be like, oh, you know, just like get distracted by the things in the, in the room happening, but really just to connect with why you wrote the thing you wrote and why you need to get it out. Um, and then Krista Franklin, who created the, the, um, the piece of art that inspired the title, she's also a great mentor to me. She's a visual artist and poet, 
and um, collage artist. And I think of a lot of my songs as collages. I do a lot of sampling and illusions and drawing from things. In this case, a lot of things that were like interviews or texts. Um, but I always think of myself as like a sampling artist, a collage artist. And so that comes from her for sure. Yeah, you did a lot of sampling on Heaven and then you sort of took it to a different place yes, in this new it's expensive. record. Yeah. But that's kind of neat. I, I'd be curious to see how you'll evolve with your sampling on your next record and your one after that. Thank you. Um, there is so much lyrically to chew on in this record. I, I hear something new every time I listen to a song but there's also a lot of sonic variety here. And I'd like to know how the process of bringing the words and the music together works for you because you work with a producer, which mm -hmm. just sounds like something you really enjoy. Yeah, I do. I like I like working face to face more so than um, I guess some of some of the songs did start from just a folder of beats from slot A, which is how I kind of realized I should go meet him and work with him more. But those songs, I think, had a really specific energy to them, like the the instrumental of Miles and Muddy and Giovanni were already created and I kind of wrote on top of them. But then when we started working together more, it, w it would become that more intentional space of, this is Sun Ra, let's, let's watch the movie, let's listen to some of his music and really study him and then create like a sonic home for this type of energy together. And so with Sun Ra and Octavia, we were able to kind of talk more about the space that we wanted to create for the, for the content more so than the other way around. And, oh my gosh, going back to your voice, so magnificent. And I feel that you sound so confident on this record. And I know you started when you were very young singing in the church and in the choir. I'm curious what your journey was to find your solo voice, which we're so happy that you found. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's true. I, f I felt like I was more confident because of almost, it's almost like, like if I was giving a, a presentation on like how much I love my mom, like I would just be invigorated by that. So it was like having, not only having it be about me, like it is about me, it's, it's an album about me, but it has so much more power from these other people that it gave me that confidence, if that makes sense. Um, but I think that when I started out as a young person, I was singing in the church, which is a very comfortable environment, very supportive environment, but outside of, choir singing, I never felt confident in my voice um, all the way through high school. I knew I loved singing, but I was like, I don't have the type of solo voice. I don't have that voice. I, I never got the solos in choir. I was more like um, a really solid choir person. And then it wasn't until I started doing poetry that I realized that just being true to your authentic voice, um, the way it actually sounds is the most powerful thing. Because in poetry, there's this thing called poet voice. And it's when you kind of just talk like this and everyone starts to sound the same. And I never did that because I never really I never really knew how. And uh, my mentors really were like, hey, like, that's amazing. Like, you just sound like you. That's going to get you really far. And I kind of just started to apply that to music because why, why is it different? And I started to write my own songs and realized that no one can sing my own songs better than me because I wrote them for myself. So that was kind of the path to that. And I think... Hopefully with each new project, I just want to be exploring, exploring how far I can push that. So it sounds like you were really pushing yourself to do more with your voice on this record. Yeah, definitely. I feel like I really hear that on the song Zora, which you started with today, the first song that you sang. And tell me about that song. Yeah, that song is inspired by Zora Neale Hurston. And she has an essay called How It Feels to Be Colored Me. And in it, she says, um, she says, I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background, talking about kind of when she went to college and was the only black person around. But then she also says, I feel most colored when I'm surrounded by other black people and we're laughing and like all of our laughs just like join in this chorus. So kind of this feeling of like how she defines her blackness. And I really related to that because I grew up in a neighborhood, Beverly in Chicago, that was mostly white and would often go, you know, to church, mostly black, and just being, trying to figure out where I fit, um, always feeling like not black enough in one space or too black in another space. And so just that chorus line of you will never know everything, I will never know everything is really referring to no one can tell me what my blackness is or define it for me. 
um, because I'm still discovering it and it's infinite and I'm still going to be discovering it my whole life. And so just kind of that mantra of self-acceptance and um, giving myself permission to be my full self, however that evolves. You've also talked in interviews about balancing the masculine and feminine. And tell me about a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think with the album, I when I was ordering it and thinking of the flow, I just wanted to like front load it with feminine energy or just kind of make sure I was intentional with the order and putting Betty first, knowing that I have both many, Betty Davis and Miles Davis, just knowing that um, just that I wanted to have that that um, kind of flow first, but then in the Muddy and Miles songs, like, again, I'm not speaking as Muddy or Miles Davis. I'm harnessing that masculine energy. Like, when people talk about Miles Davis, they're like, he spoke so soft so that everyone would have to lean in so make sure they heard him. Like, it was just this power emanating from him. And I've noticed, I think for myself, I was realizing that I'm an introvert. I'm a quiet person, and in this industry, that can sometimes be a challenge when you have to be the leader and you have to be the boss. And so I was trying to harness that energy in myself. So I wanted to include that energy, but not have it be like the prioritized energy and have like all of these Zora, Frida, Giovanni come first and then, and then have the masculine energy after that. Um, this is in my head that just I, was a way of ordering it, so that felt authentic, yeah. I feel like I can really connect to that as well. When I read your sort of description of that, that really resonated with me, you know, wanting to find that as well. It's very powerful. I'm also um, was very captivated by Sun Ra and Octavia Butler. I mean, those are very interesting artists. Tell me what about them made you want to include those songs. Yeah, I think I've always been really interested in Afrofuturism and just the idea of envisioning black people in the future as a radical thing because often black people aren't gifted, allowed a future. Um, and so I think that's great about Sun Ra. With Octavia and specifically, I saw the pictures that went viral of her notebooks where she wrote down all of the goals that she had for herself and literally every single thing came true. It was like, I want to have a house for my mom. I want to win this award, every single thing. And it was so specific. And to me, that was very powerful. And, and when I was reading her book, Kindred, which is all about um, this woman who kind of falls through a hole in a dimension and ends up in slavery times of, of the, how, the house of the white family who owned her ancestors. And so this is kind of convoluted, but basically after I read that book, I started researching like how black people would learn to read in slavery times and how it was literally like a crime stealing a book from someone's library to like teach yourself phonics like in a dark room. And so just thinking of the history of black people in writing and how amazing it is to me that however many years later Octavia Butler used writing to bring her goals to life and then being a teacher, a teacher working with young people, looking at the ways in which still I have students who are insecure because they don't speak proper grammar or they, they, have, they don't get an A plus on their essay because, you know, they struggle with writing. And so just thinking of the ways that all of those things, um, just wanting to create a song that's kind of like you are already everything. You are, you, you're the truth already. You're a fact already. No one can take that away from you. It's kind of a song to myself, but to also to my students or to anyone who kind of doubts themselves in that way. Um, because I think, yeah, I think Octavia Butler is just a great example of someone who manifested things through only what she had. Yeah. You're listening to KEXP. It's Jamila Woods talking about her latest album, Legacy, Legacy, out on Jag Jaguar Records. For you personally, what's been the most significant thing to come out of working on making and performing Legacy, Legacy? Honestly, being on this tour is definitely one of the things because I, I never did a full support tour of an artist before and I had opportunities to, but I, I wanted to make sure it was a good fit. And um, when Raphael Sadiq, the opportunity to open for him came, it just seemed so perfect because I also consider him to be a legend and have we, we like unintentionally like 
we sample like a part of anniversary and in, in our arrangements and like we didn't even realize that till we were already opening for him we're like he's just everywhere like his influence is everywhere so I think being able to observe um his band and his team and his artistry on this tour has been amazing and um be coming closer with our, my band and just getting to create new arrangements for the music um has been really cool Jamila Woods and Raphael Sadiq playing tonight at the Neptune Theater here in Seattle. You ready for another song? Yeah, ready. But are you willing to compromise within a relationship? To compromise? What is compromising? Compromising for, for, for what? Compromising for what reason? To compromise? For what? To compromise. What is compromise? If a man came into your life, wouldn't you want to compromise? <laughs> Stupid.
That is Holy from Jamila Woods' 2016 album, Heaven. You also heard Eartha from the latest release, Legacy, Legacy. I heard you were thinking of Eartha Kit as your guardian angel while making this record. Is that true? While making the Eartha song, I was thinking of her as, like, giving me relationship advice. <laughs> she had some good advice there in that opening piece that you yes. had. You're listening to KEXP, Where the Music Matters. It's Jamila Woods live in the studio with us today. Her newest album called Legacy, Legacy. Thank you all so much. That was fabulous. Thank you for having us. You're listening to KEXP Seattle. Discover great music at kexp.org.